Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, to the Digital Storytelling Colloquium organized by the Institute uh, for Digital Research in the Humanities. I'm Silvia Fernandez one of the team members of the IDRH and the Public and Digital Humanities Postdoctoral Fellow. The IDRH Digital Storytelling Colloquium is a series of virtual events focused on the ethics, politics, and techniques of digital storytelling. Stretch over the length of the academic year, these events have featured explanatory Exemplary projects from across the world and across the KU campus model digital storytelling practices and introduce participants to a range of digital storytelling tools and storytellers. Across all events, the vision of the colloquium is to build a community of inquiry and an incubator for ideas. Few housekeeping reminders I want to share with you before we start. The presentation will last about 45 minutes, and after that, we invite all to have a conversation with the presenter. And during the presentation, if you have questions of, or comments, feel free to participate via chat and in the Q&A section. Few announcements of upcoming events. We invite you to look at the call for participants to the first ever community and academic Public and Digital Humanities Summer Institute. In the chat, you will find the site for more details. And I will add that shortly. And the second annual African Digital Humanities Symposium that will be happening online the 9th of November. The registration is now open. And today we have the honor to have a la gran maestra, from El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. I see a lot of part participants also from my hometown and I feel very honored about that. La doctora Yolanda Chavez Leiva with her talk titled Digital Humanities and the Radical Act of Humanizing. Dr. Leiva is a fronteriza born and raised in the US-Mexico border. She has dedicated her career to documenting the stories of people on the border. She teaches border and Mexican American history as an associate professor at the University of Texas at El Paso and directs the Institute of Oral History, IOH. Her most recent oral history project is Seeking Refugee, a collection of in interviews with asylum seekers and their advocates in which she is assisted by her doctoral research assistants Kimberly Sumano Ortega and Ligia Arguiles. She is also a founding member of Paso del Sur, a grassroots organization that works with barrios facing demolition and displacement. The IOH was recently awarded the Texas Digital Libraries Award for Public Outreach for their video series on border stories. With deepest admiration to all her work, she has done enormous efforts to maintain the memory alive of borderlands communities through the tradition of storytelling. The work of La Doctora Leiva is an example of public and digital humanities work deeply rooted in her community, which means a work that has a compromise and is done with the heart. As she shares in her blog, Fear Fronteriza, that seeks to in inspire hope, consciousness, action to create a more just world by sharing the histories and stories of border people through essays, photographs, and interviews. Centering history from the periphery provides us different perspectives, invisible collections and alliances become visible. As she mentions, trauma and perseverance live side by side. These histories reveal the past, illuminate the present, and provide us a vision for the future. Please join me in welcoming a la doctora Leiva. Bienvenida, maestra. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Fernandez, for the very generous uh, introduction. And I'm very grateful to be here and grateful for the opportunity to share some of the work with you and also to hear your responses and, and your questions. As you just heard, I'm from the University of Texas at El Paso. I was born in Juarez, raised in El Paso, and I am a borderlands historian as well as an oral historian. I'm here in the offices of the Institute of Oral History. We're the largest collection of border-related oral histories in the United States. We have been in existence almost 50 years. We're getting ready to celebrate our 50th anniversary. And I never thought I would end up being an oral historian or directing this institute. But what got me here, what started me on this path is that I was given to my great aunt and uncle as a newborn. And because they were my grandparents' generation, they were born in the 1910, they crossed from what is to El Paso as children. So my earliest memories are of their storytelling, telling me about what it was like to be a child crossing the border, talking about what it was like to, for my mother, be a flapper in the 1920s with her very conservative immigrant father, about the Great Depression, about my father's service in World War II. So I feel very blessed that I grew up hearing stories from them and stories in my neighborhood from older residents who, who had just incredible, incredible memories of their lives. So I guess in a way it makes sense that I ended up here doing this as my career, but also doing it as my calling. I'd like to share my PowerPoint with you right now. There we go. So digital humanities and that radical act of humanizing. I'm gonna talk, talk about doing history on the border. So let me start with this idea of humanizing. I, since my teenage years have, have gone back to the ancient writings of Mexico to look at that philosophy, to look at those concepts that are often very profound. And there's a set of concepts that guides me as an educator, as a teacher, and they come from these writings called the Huehuetlatoli, which means the ancient, ancient teachings. And one of the mandates for teachers was this word right here in Nahuatl, Caneco humanizing our love for others. Teachers are supposed to humanize their students' love for others. So when we're talking about love, we're not talking about romantic love, mushy love, any of that kind of love. But to me, that love means seeing the humanity in others and striving for a place where we all see each other as humans. So when I talk about humanizing, I'm talking about seeing each other, understanding each other, listening to each other as part of this great whole place, whether we're talking the earth, our city, our nation, our binational region. So why is humanizing the border a radical act? Since the beginning of the current borderline, which we can trace back to the end of the US-Mexico war and the creation of this new border, there has been an increasing othering of people on the Mexican side. You can read newspapers here in this region where I live, going back to the 1880s, talking about the, the aliens crossing the border. The border has been connected with disease, and we've seen that recently with COVID and, and this 
narrative that immigrants bring disease, criminality, immigrants are criminals and, and we'll remember the, the campaign of the previous president that talked about Mexicans being rapists and drug dealers. On the border, people are often dehumanized. I have a photo here from early in 2019 when many, many refugees were coming to the border to seek asylum, coming mostly from Central America. And under the previous administration, the policies were all intended to deter future migration, future asylum seekers through the use of cruelty. So as a way to really showcase from the point of view of the US government, you don't want to come here. Hundreds of asylum seekers were corralled in under the international bridge by barbed wire. If you were walking to Juarez on the international bridge, you could hear the people below and they slept on the gravel. We have an oral history with an attorney that talks about the babies, the toddlers, the children of her clients who came out of this with small round bruises all over their bodies because they were asleep on the gravel. So this to me, corralling people on dirt in a very unsanitary place because it's under the bridge and, and you have pigeons and all the droppings. So that is dehumanizing. And on the border, sometimes dehumanizing almost seems naturalized. That's what happens. And for people away from the border who are reading about what it's like to live here, if you're reading the media, it is often a very dehumanizing narrative about the border. So to humanize people on the border is indeed a very radical act. So I wanted to talk about two things. One, the lessons that I have learned over the years of doing public and digital history on the border. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about the projects that we've been doing here at the Institute of Oral History. I'm very blessed here at the Institute, and we're part of the history department, that the history department assigns two PhD student research assistants every year. And we usually work together for several years. So I have very wonderful students. I have two wonderful staff members, and we work all together to do history on the border. So let me talk about lessons that I've learned. The first lesson, and students who have taken classes with me know that I always take them to the streets. I take them out of the classroom. Here is a photo from 2009, I believe, where we were walking on the streets of an area called El Segundo Barrio, or the Second Ward, which is constantly among the top five poorest zip codes in the United States. Currently, it's the third poorest zip code in the United States. It's a place that itself is dehumanized. People say, oh, the people from there are ignorant, the people from there are dirty, the people from there don't pay taxes. So very often the children start to to believe that it's a bad place. And very often the little children start to express uh, shame about being from there. When in reality, if you look at the Segundo Barrio, it is a place of creativity. It is a place of beauty. It is a place of resilience. It's a place that despite being under constant attack, continues to live on. So go to the streets. 
so that students can ground themselves, so that students can ground themselves in the place that we are talking about. So go to the streets is one of, of the lessons that I have learned. I have just a collage of photos here of one of the projects that we did in 2009. We rented two tenement apartments in at Segundo Barrio and created a small community museum. We had a $10,000 grant. Most of that went to pay rent for the year. So we were doing everything. As you can see, there's students painting, there are students helping the muralist, there is a small child helping the, one of the um, people installing the photos. So we go to the streets, but we also take action. And in this example, we created this small three room museum that told the history of that barrio and of some of the people who had lived in that barrio. And as I said, it was very low budget. This is the mural that we were able to contract a muralist to paint for us there in the courtyard of Museo Urbano. That's what we call our, our little museum. And the reason that we found it very important to use art in a space that is about history is because another lesson is this very famous phrase, la cultura pura, or culture heals. So we've also believed very much that art is part of history and that culture has the ability to heal. When I think of myself as a curator, for example, in Spanish, the word for curator, for a woman curator is curadora. It comes from the same root as curar, to heal. So culture heals. Here in this commissioned mural, we had zoot suitors. The zoot suit culture really took root in the segundo in the 1930s and 1940s. On the left side with the, the base is a man named, his stage name is Don Tosti. His given name was Edmundo Tostado and he grew up in El Segundo. He is the first Latino composer to sell a million albums. And that was in the 1940s for a uh, song called Pachuco Boogie. So we wanted people to know that just a few blocks away from that museum was this great musician who contributed not just to Mexican American culture, but was well known throughout the United States. So la cultura dura, culture heals. One of the wonderful things that really reinforced this idea about culture healing was that as David Flores, who was the artist that, that was doing the mural, as he started to put the mural up on the wall of the, the little courtyard of the tenement, young men, and it was interesting because it was young men, young men started to come and ask, can we paint murals? And we asked the property owner and she said, yes. So we had barrio residents come and paint different murals. Here's, here's one of the murals that you'll see. And it was a very amazing experience to see so many small murals start to appear around the courtyard. One of the murals that you can see in this photo to the right, the red, white, and black one is the very iconic symbol of the United Farm Workers. So this is the courtyard where you can see the different, different murals. 
one Sunday, I was sweeping the courtyard because we did everything. We didn't have a museum staff, we did everything. I was sweeping the courtyard and the museum is about a block away from the church that is really the heart of the Segundo Barrio. It's called Sacred Heart Church. So an uh, older lady was walking down the street coming from mass and she looked in and saw me sweeping and then she saw this mural of the United Farm Workers symbol and she asked me if she could come into the courtyard to look at it. And I said, of course. And so she started telling me that she had been a farm worker and that she had been in a farm worker strike and that she had been in a farm worker union before the United Farm Workers going back to the 1950s. And then the most amazing thing happened. She pulled out her wallet and out of her wallet, she pulled her union card from 1954. And I knew that art elicits stories. Art evokes memories. Art helps create or recreate history. So those days where we had the murals painted in the courtyard were in many ways to me very magical days of working in community and doing this kind of history. Eventually the murals were all painted over by the, by the landlord. So right now you, you don't see them. La cultura cura. Here we are in this room that we call the Teresita Urrea room. She was an internationally known healer from Mexico. When she came to the United States, she was in exile from the dictatorship in Mexico. She was 19 years old when she came. And the dictator of Mexico at that time in the 1890s, Porfirio Diaz, called her the most dangerous girl in Mexico most dangerous girl in Mexico. So we dedicated a room to her. And we had community cultural workers come and perform music and perform dance and bring life to that little corner. So go to the streets, know that culture heals. The third lesson is the importance of creating and nurturing relationships. This work has built upon the relationships, the multi-generational relationships that come from being present in a community. This photo right here is right outside of the Border Farm Worker Center. From the Border Farm Workers Center, you can see the border. It's a block away. The photo that you see, where it says Museo Urbano, uh, Historia Obrera, wor Workers' History, is a 1920s photo of men standing on the corner waiting for work. The three men that you see below the photo were standing on the corner waiting to be picked up for work. And very often, I would take out that, that actual photo to these corners and I would, I would talk to the men and say, look, here's a photo from 1925 down the street, men looking for work, waiting for someone to hire them for the day. And very often the response was like, oh, we're part of this long history. We're part of something older than today. And that was true. I thought it was important for people to understand they were part of, of history. But the second response to me was even more significant. 
because this was almost a hundred years earlier, this photo. And then the, the senores, the men would tell me, but how come nothing's changed? Why are we still here in this barrio on the corner waiting to get day work? And that I thought was a critical and brilliant question to ask. Why has nothing changed? So we created and we nurtured relationships, sometimes by talking to day workers on the street, by being present in community spaces like this. This is a nonprofit called La Mujer Obrera, the woman worker that was created by displaced women garment workers. As the garment industry moved from El Paso across the border to Juarez. So we collaborated with La Mujer Obrera in these community spaces as a way also to create and nurture relationships. This is also La Mujer Obrera. Part of nurturing and creating relationships was to relax and to, so this is a combination of uh, culture heals and creating relationships. So sometimes it was just amazing for the community to be able to relax and to enjoy ourselves. At this event, uh, my, my co colleague and co-founder co Jose Urbano had discovered in our special collections at the UTEP Library a song that had been written a hundred years before and that had not been performed for a hundred years, written by a, a Mexican composer here in El Paso. So at this event, some high school students played that song. So we're always mixing culture and history together because culture, whether it's music or art and history are just natural partners with each other. Again, here we are at an event where we were talking about, in this case, what was our favorite food? What food did we connect to, to our childhoods? That's why everyone's smiling because everyone was very happy to be thinking about those kinds of memories about food. But if you look in the background, we also did as part of the, the exhibit for this event is we did, on the right, you'll see some farm workers. On the left, you'll see a photo of a Mexican American lady in her kitchen in the 1940s. And it was just a very small, small kitchen and she had to be very creative to cook. So we thought about not just what were the foods of our childhood, but we thought about what does it mean to come from a people who, whose work has put food on our table? What does it mean to come from a people whose grandmothers were so limited in resources, yet took their families forward? Here's a little bit more of an exhibit we did there. Part of building community also shows through the exhibits that we've curated. So this exhibit through a child's eyes talked about what it was like growing up in El Paso from the 1880s to the 1950s. And we recreated a representation of a neighborhood. You could go to school, you could go home and see the laundry hanging, you could 
go to the street corner because many Mexican American children had to drop out of school through the 1930s in order to work. So you could see what, what newspaper boys carried. And people would come into this exhibit and want to talk about their childhoods. So even though we may just have seen them one time, it was creating a human connection with them. Another lesson, cross the modern borderline. At a time when the border is so controversial, at a time when, and at the time that we did this exhibit, a fence was being built, not the border wall, but the previous border fence. And you could drive along the border highway and just see that fence going up. We wanted to think about, we wanted to envision a time before there was that border, before there were fences, before there were walls, before there were border patrol, uh, immigration officials. What was the, what, what was it like then? What were our relationships? So at the Archaeology Museum, we curated walking with the ancestors from Mesoamerica to the Southwest. And we talked about the connections among people. What did people coming from the South to the North bring? What did people walking from the North to the South take? What were those cultural connections? What were those linguistic connections? What does it tell us about ourselves in the modern day when these nation state borderlines divide us? And one of the things that, that meant a lot to me in this exhibit, in this place, was that it was right next door to the Border Patrol Museum. So I really felt that it was giving an alternative narrative to the narrative right next door. We asked people to write comments and very often they were very surprised at the connections between North and South. On the right, we used um, ritual items, ceremonial items from the North and the South to talk about spiritual connection, about connections of cosmology. Another lesson that we learned was to share ownership. In oral history, there's a very famous phrase about shared authority. I say shared ownership. We created an exhibit called Healing Hands and Healing Ways, Traditional Medicine in the Borderlands. And we asked traditional healers to join us in curating this exhibit so that each little piece of the exhibit represented a traditional healer in our community. So we had someone, as you see on the left, come and set up a traditional altar, as you might find in your grandmother's house. On the right, we set up a place that would sell medicinal herbs, which is to be very common, common here in El Paso. So how do we share ownership of Base. How do we share ownership of knowledge? You know, it's very important to me as an educator to model for my students that I am not the expert when we go into community. People are the experts of their own lives. My responsibility is to listen. My responsibility is to create spaces for that knowledge that exists in the community to shine. So share ownership. 
And the last lesson that, that I have learned over the years is never be afraid to serve. Not very often, academics do not talk about serving the community, but we are, we are servants. And this is Mr. Felipe Serrano and our manager, Alejandra Zavala. Mr. Serrano was a gentleman that we had conducted an oral history with in 2017, maybe 2016. And he had come as a temporary agricultural worker through the Bracero program. And so he told us all that story. And we went to see him a few times. On his deathbed, he called and said he wanted to see us. So we went to visit him at his home. And it was just a very, very touching moment that he had called to see us before he died. So I walked in and I said, Mr. Serrano, do you remember who I am? And he says, of course I remember who you are. So then I thought, that's amazing, he remembers who I am. It turns out he didn't remember who I was. He remembered me as a woman from his village who had given him food to eat when he was a boy and he was very hungry because he grew up extremely impoverished and often they didn't have food. So he told us the whole story because I kept asking him questions like, and when you would come to my house, what would happen? And what did I feed you? I don't remember. So he shared this really beautiful story and this very uh, grateful moment to that woman that somehow she thought I was, but that was from his childhood. And to me, even that was a, a point of service to, to be there and not to tell him, no, no, that's not me but to, to let him remember those hard times as a kid and to be able to tell that person that helped him, thank you. I was happy to serve as that representation. So never be afraid to serve. That's what we're here for. I'd like to turn to tell you about a few of our projects. We have a project called Seeking Refuge. Oh no, let me start it with Bracero 75. Let me start with that. Bracero 75. For several years, the Institute of Oral History collected interviews with the men who came through the temporary work program. And we have about 600 oral histories with them, very rich oral histories. So that was probably maybe 2000 five to 2010, it was prior to, to my time as director. As the 75th anniversary of the Bracero program was coming up, we partnered with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, who was working on preserving the last existing Bracero processing center in the United States, which happens to be near El Paso. We we partnered with them to start doing more oral histories. So we call it Bracero 75 because it was going to be the 75th anniversary. And we began to, to meet men late 80s into their 90s who had entered the Bracero program as 17 year olds, 18 year olds, towards the end of the program in the 1960s. So we have digitized oral histories and we've also created videos based on those oral histories. So we have Bracero 75. Uncaged art. In 2018, In response to the previous administration's family separation policy, the Health and Human Services through the Office of Refugee Resettlement was authorized 
to build what they've called emergency influx centers. And these so-called influx centers were to house, although it was more like incarcerate children who had been separated from their families or across the border by themselves. So these children were coming to seek asylum, mostly from Central America. And Tornillo, which is a small rural town about 30 miles east of El Paso, became the laboratory for the federal government. How do you house thousands of children? So they built this detention center at Tornillo. Children were housed in huge tents. They had to bring in water throughout the day because it wasn't connected to water. It wasn't connected to electricity. So they also had to have generators. And of course it wasn't connected to a sewage system. So they also had to take out sewage many times per day. It cost 2 million per day to run this. And at its height, it had about 2,600, mostly boys. There were a few hundred girls, but it was mostly boys. And it was very militaristic. Each of the tents was named after the military alphabet of alphabet of Charlie um, Delta. They were supervised very closely, 24 hours a day. If they had to go to the bathroom, someone went with them. If they were going from their tent where they slept to the tent where they ate, they walked in lines. They were supposed to be very straight lines or they would get in trouble. And these kids had no clue what was happening. They didn't know where Texas was, much less where Tornillo was. They didn't know why suddenly they were behind barbed wire. And they didn't know if or when they would be released. The priest that was giving mass there told me that it was a combination between Disneyland and concentration camp because they had snacks and they would see movies, but they were behind barbed wire. So in January of 2019, through Father Rafael Garcia, the priest that was giving mass, we acquired 30 pieces of art created by the kids in Tornillo. We have two examples here. One was an amazing soccer field, and then on the left is, is the church. They had the most expensive of materials. They had popsicle sticks, construction paper. They recycled boxes. They had pipe cleaners little rocks that they picked up from outside they had yarn and they created in the space of four days 400 pieces of art out of those 400 pieces of art 370 were thrown away and we have the 30 that were left because this art is so fragile because it was made with, with such an expensive materials, we created a digitized version that has traveled all over the United States. It's also across the border into Florida, where communities print out the images, the professional photographs of the art, and we provide the text panels that they can also print out. And communities, which include universities, libraries, churches, have mounted it in so many different ways. I know one community mounted it on barbed wire. Other communities have put it on walls. In Juarez, it was on a fence at the Autonomous University of Ciudad Juarez. So we created this digitized traveling exhibit so that people would learn about what was happening here on the border and right now there's still 
600 to yesterday, I heard an estimate of a thousand children that were separated at the border that the government doesn't know what happened to their parents because it was a very chaotic system and, and there wasn't the adequate uh, record keeping. Seeking refuge. The very same day that Father Garcia called me and said, we have this incredible art. Yolanda, do you want it? On that same day, I had just completed the first oral history of our project, Seeking Refuge. And this project was to conduct oral histories with asylum seekers, as well as activists, advocates, attorneys who worked with them. So we were crossing the border every week to conduct oral histories in Juarez. Here is one example of asylum seekers. Uh, the woman on the left in the bright pink and the woman in the blue are both indigenous women from Guatemala. Between them, they had four children. The man on the far right is an activist. And I was in, in Juarez that day. They were staying at one of the largest shelters in Juarez. That was at the time when uh, the Trump administration was sending asylum seekers to wait for the court dates on the Mexican side. So mostly women and children were being very unceremoniously dumped on the Mexican side and left to figure it out, often without resources, without family members. And the community in Juarez did organize to assist and, and churches organized to assist, but they were very vulnerable to organized crime, very vulnerable to gangs who would see this woman and children and then say, oh, do you want to ride? And then they were so desperate, they would say yes, and then they would get kidnapped. They were vulnerable to trafficking. They were um, very vulnerable to rape. So I, I don't show people's faces on purpose. But here they were looking inside a gym of, of Lucha Libre wrestling. And they were really excited to see that. And we were on our way to, to get lunch. So seeking refuge has been, um, to me, a, a very important project. This is a very historic time on the border. And it's in digitized form. The oral histories are digitized. We are, for now, holding on to the, the women's oral histories. We don't use their name. We don't ask what city they're from. We don't ask any identifying information, but just for the sake of safety, we're holding on to those oral histories, but we are releasing the, the oral histories with attorneys and advocates. And then we have one oral history with a young man who'd been at Tornillo before he, was, uh, before he turned 18. And he asked us to please release it because he wanted people to know his story. So Seeking Refuge is an ongoing project, even though COVID definitely has gotten in the way of our ability to do that. Here's our website. Here's our email. Uh, I know I've just touched on everything very, very briefly, but I wanted to give you an idea of what we do here in order to humanize the border. And I would be happy to hear your response or answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Leiva. It was such a great um, presentation. I think you, you make us feel a lot, especially because you started with the values and with the learnings and, and ending with this um, very, very compromised projects um, with the border community. I want to 
to invite the the participants to to bring in some comments, some questions. If you want to to speak, um, you can raise your hand and and we can enable um, that function. Thank you, Dr. Leva. Thank you. And we have we have one question. Um, we can start with that one from uh, Dave Tell. Um, can you expand on the role of art in history, in justice work, and in oral history? Uh, definitely. I, I over the years have had the pleasure of working with many border artists and it's been not even on purpose on my part it's just it's just kind of happened so what i know about art is that art brings emotions to us and art helps us remember things so if I were, well, if I were, I do write text panels in exhibits. So there's a text panel. And I'm saying the history of da 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 da. And people maybe spend two seconds looking at it. But if I have an art piece in an exhibit that is connected to whatever I'm writing about, it's going to have a different kind of effect on people. It will help people remember things. It will help people feel. It will use different parts of the brain. So art to me is very important in telling history. When it comes to oral history, because oral history is asking people also to remember and to make meaning of their memories. If you can use the different senses, whether it's sight or smell, or I've seen taste used as a way to elicit stories from people, you're going to get let me put it this way. Sometimes when we do oral histories, people are very nervous. And they're like, we have to sound a certain way, or we have to be very smart, or we have to answer everything you know, historically accurate. But what I often want to know is when you look back on your life, what, what do you feel? What, did, what does it mean to you? So for example, I have a doctoral student who's doing oral histories about a plant that's all over our desert. It's a medicinal plant. It's called a creosote bush, governadora, guami, it has many names. So before she does an oral history with somebody about that plant, she has them smell it. It has a very strong smell. So if you can smell something, or if you can see something, it opens you up in a whole different way than simply me asking a question. I was once at um, a museum program where one of the elders in our community was using uh, mortar and pestle, uh, mortajete, and we're showing people how to how to grind up chiles. And, it, and so people don't particularly use that technology anymore because we have blenders, and things like that. But as she started to do it, people in the audience started to cry. And I was like, why are people crying? This is fascinating to me. Well, I, I was crying too. And everyone was saying, it's because it reminds us of our grandmothers. So all of those things that evoke those memories are important. Let's see, somebody. Yeah, Dr. Leib, uh, um, we have um, one question that um, from Sandra Enriquez. 
And she's asking about how can communities and organizations request the Uncaged Art Traveling Exhibit? Just write to me, why Leva at utep.edu would be glad to set it up. It's very simple. Yeah, so just write to us, why Leva at utep.edu. And the more places this exhibit goes, the better. There's no cost to you other than however you print it and want to set it up. So we're happy to provide all of that to you digitally. Definitely. Thank you, Dr. Leva. And like in connection with using technology, there is a question about, could you say a little bit more about the act of humanizing through technologies and the ways in which serving communities through digital projects help us keep the humanities component of digital humanities in view? Thank you so much for your work. It's I think that's such a great question about how do you humanize through technologies? You know, videos have been such an important part of our mission to humanize. Since we do many of our oral histories, uh, we record them through video and then can, can create videos. Educators are taking those videos and showing them to their classes all over the, the United States. So, and, and we want these stories to go all over the United States, again, because we want people to see the humanity in fronterizos and fronterizas. We want people to, to see us as fellow humans. So those, those videos, where you see a 90 year old man remembering when he was 19 and coming to the United States to really work for our economy. And you see his eyes tearing up that, that, that visual piece. And where you, you see, I'm thinking of one video in particular, you see his hands and they're, they're just, so you know, gnarled from all his years of work and he's missing a finger, like all of that, that we could not do without digital technology and that we could not provide to anybody who has the internet without that technology. That's a, an amazing opportunity that we have as digital humanities people, that it's so available and I am also very aware of the divide between people who, who have access to computers and people who don't have access to the computers. We work with a 93-year-old community organizer, and she has no clue what we're doing when it comes to the internet. And what she calls it is you put things on your phone. So I know that there's that part of the community. But for the part of the community, the children in schools or the, the students in universities or community members who, who have it, what a wonderful opportunity. I love that we have this video about Mr. Leopoldo Avila, who was in his 90s when we talked to him. And he told me something that I'm never going to forget. At the end of our interview, he told me, now I can die in peace because someone has listened to me. And that has shaped me so much as an oral historian. So I think there's Mr. Avila saying now he can die in peace. And he passed away in May of this year. But I think we did an, a video about him. His story is going to be listened to by people all over of all ages hopefully for years to come. And I think I listened to him, but now other people can listen to him. And that's through the technologies that we have. So I hope that that answers your question. Thank you, Dr. Leva. We have another question um, in relation to memory and history. Mm -hmm. And how would you define the first one and what it will be 
its relationship with history. So the relationship of memory to history. We can think of history as everything that's happened ever in the past. And we will never know everything that's happened. Even if we are studying one very particular person or event, we're not gonna know everything. When we do oral histories with people, and I'm asking them, you know, what was it like when you were at the processing center? And then they'll tell me, well, we stood in line. They have those, those memories about the buildings or the, or the process. So that's, that's one kind of memory that helps us fill in the details of history. What is equally important to me as far as history is what did it mean to them? What did, what did being in Chihuahua for two days, standing in line without anything to eat, to wait to hear your name, call so you could cross the border, what does that mean to them? So history is not simply all of what, what we would think of the facts. History is what meaning we make of it. So memory, meaning, and history are all intertwined together. And when we have those three intertwined together, then we can reflect on ourselves. And what does it mean to us? What does this history mean to us? And eventually, I hope we reflect on our own lives. What do our own lives mean as we look back on them? You know, one of the things that has been very different between interviewing the 90-year-old former Braceros and the 30-year-old asylum seekers with their babies is that the 90-year-olds look back and they tell us horrible details of what they went through, being sprayed in the face with DDT, for example, and how humiliating it was. And they've always cried telling their stories. But at the end of the interview, after telling us these, these humiliating situations they went through, they look back on their lives and what it means to them and a very common thing they say is, but it was worth it because of my family. And now my family's in the United States and they have opportunity. Interviewing the 30 year old mother seeking asylum who are in Juarez, not knowing what's gonna happen is hearing a story that doesn't have a conclusion yet. They don't know what, what their life is going to turn out like. They don't even know what tomorrow is going to be like. So, so the memories that they're sharing with us might be memories from a month ago, six months ago. So memory is so complex in how, in how we work with it in oral history and what meaning we make of it as listeners to that history and to those memories. Thank you so much, Dr. Leiva. I want to add a, a question um, from my own specifically in regards to if you can speak a little bit more about how you're archiving this oral histories and what's the process of whenever these um, oral histories are in the public domain or what are the protocols you follow to if they are available to the general public or not specifically because of the issues of of border surveillance and of this transnational um 
uh, scenarios that we live here in the border, which are stories also from Mexico, but are being housed in the United States. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yes, of course. Um, well, to begin with, when, when we asked to do an oral history with somebody, we, we want to make sure they do want to share their story with us. And we talk a lot and we think a lot about the ethics of all of that, especially with the Seeking Refuge Project because it's, it's, to me, a whole different kind of ethical issue to be interviewing people who are so traumatized at that moment. When we do an oral history, of course, we have to have um, a, a, a release form, legal form, giving us the right. They are, well, we have our collection, but the collection, we work with the, the UTEP library so that it's on a, on a website. So you can search anything that we put up. But we're also, so we have, I don't know how many we have, more than a thousand oral histories are available to the website. And if you go to the utep.edu liberal arts oral history, you'll see our website, but it also will show you where to search for the collection. But like I was saying, as because we have these very painful oral histories of the women, that's also been a very challenging thing for us because we, we don't want to release them right now, even though there's no way for those women to be tracked. No one could ever track an individual woman from that story. But it's almost like wanting to, to protect those stories still, wanting to hold on to those stories still, wanting, and it, it's, I don't know how this is going to, to sound coming from an academic, but, but keeping those oral histories safe to me feels like I'm, I'm still hugging those women at the end of the interview. I don't want to expose their stories yet. And I don't know if that makes any sense, but we talk a lot about it here. Like, are we ready to expose? stories and, and we're not we're not the stories are so painful and some of the, the women that we talked to we never have seen again some of the women that we've interviewed we continue a relationship with some have been released since biden became president and are reunited with their families and we, we certainly um remain in touch with them. But it's, it's, um, I don't even know what to say. It, it, it's, it's very emotional to have these stories that we are responsible for. Thank you so much, Dr. Leva. We have a last question. And after that, we can wrap up um, this last question. Um, it's about if there have been any reflection on the distinction between construction of narratives and the reporting of histories, especially as you put together collections and exhibits. Could you ask me that question one more time? Yes, absolutely. Um, the question um, it's if there has been any reflection on the distinction between construction of narratives and the reporting of histories, especially as you put together collections and exhibits. Okay. When we've used oral histories in exhibits, um, 
we almost always use use small stories coming from from the oral histories that will be a personal example of some historical process that we're talking about. So I think if we were working with this is a, a hard question just to answer. Let me back up just a little bit. Recently, I published an art. No, I haven't published it. It's, it's forthcoming. An article with the Palabras y Silencios, Words and Silences, which is the Journal of the International Oral History Association. And I was thinking about narratives, and I was thinking actually about place. So I wrote this article trying to look at a set of oral histories conducted in the 70s with people who were born in the 1880s, 90s, up to the 1910s, and what they told us about the bridges. I wanted, I was thinking, what places are, are iconic on the border? Bridges are iconic. Well, at least here, because we're, the border here is a, a river. So I was thinking, how do I construct that narrative from these diverse oral histories? And what was very amazing was the oral histories, they almost made their own narrative. Because, and it was um, five or six men and one woman, they talked about the bridge and the in very similar ways, very similar words to describe the relationship on both sides of the border, sometimes using the very same words. So in creating this narrative, it almost created itself when I pulled out very specific memories of bridges. If I was going to construct a, a broader narrative that was not Grounded in a specific place and, and went there the bridge, then that would be that would be much more challenging, I think. Well, Dr. Leva, thank you so much. Um, as you can see in in the chat, there were a lot of um, thank yous and. Yeah. Um, everyone I'm sure everyone was very very happy and we learned a lot um, with with this talk that reflects on on a lot of your expertise and the heart that you put in this work muchas gracias doctora Leiva gracias a todos por acompañarnos y que tengan una muy buena tarde thank you everybody and thank you to the institute for this opportunity Gracias, hasta luego. Bye.